Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a therapist and author based on the west side of Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictions. Welcome to my podcast, named after my recent book, It's Not About the Sex. Here we have honest conversations related to compulsive sexual behavior and trauma, all from a sexual health perspective. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints and practical strategies toward establishing greater intimacy and a more deeply connected life. Let's begin. Dr. Lucy Postolov was born in the former Soviet Union and received her medical degree with a specialty in neurology. In 1995, Lucy obtained her master's degree in acupuncture from Emperor's College here in Los Angeles. And in 2019, her doctoral degree from Pacific College of Chinese Medicine She has been practicing medicine for the last 35 years and was the first acupuncturist to receive treating privileges at Cedar sinai Medical Center. She founded her CBD company, Canopy Health, in 2018 to help patients with pain as well as emotional problems. Lucy has contributed chapters to three books about wellness medicine and sexual medicine, and has presented both nationally and internationally at numerous symposiums, as well as appearing on several TV and radio programs. So today we have Dr. Lucy Postolov with us, and I'm so pleased that you could join us today, Lucy, because not only have I known you for many years, but this is the first time we've had a Chinese medicine doctor on our show. And so this is really a treat. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I feel very honored that I'm the first doctor of Chinese medicine who's going to speak on your wonderful show. Absolutely, my pleasure. And because we haven't had Chinese medicine doctors, acupuncturists on our show, why don't we just start with the basic question? What is Chinese medicine? Chinese medicine is, from my point of view, of course, is an absolutely fascinating mix of art and science. First of all, it's been around on Mother Earth for at least three to 4,000 years. And with all new advances in medicine and in Chinese medicine, with all new clinical trials, with everything new we discover, it is still very, very, what I would say, up to date today. And if something would not really work, it would not be around for three, 4,000 years ago. That's for sure, because time is testing everything. Every single theory, every single method, every single medication, if it doesn't work, it doesn't survive the time. Mm -hmm. Besides that, of course, there are a lot of research which shows that Chinese medicine works, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, uh, a lot of other treatments, which I'm gonna talk later. They still very, very strong and potent today as much as they were three, 4,000 years ago. And we're finding the first text of Chinese medicine, which were written on the um, stone. Basically, it's like we believe or not believe, it depends on who you're gonna ask, that Moses brought us 10 commandments. When I was in China, I've seen huge stones where the first text of acupunctures were recorded. Wow. And then we already found the Yellow Empress of Chinese medicine. Again, it's mm. the first written book on the first Chinese paper. But mm. the first books on acupuncture were written on the stone. Mm. So in The base of acupuncture and the main concept of acupuncture and Chinese medicine is the concept of energy. As a doctors, we know that we have blood system and we have endocrine system and we have system of bones and uh, tendons and et cetera, et cetera, GI, brain, nervous. 
But what Chinese doctors believe, and we still believe in it, that we have the system of energy, energy flow within our body. Because nobody really can explain, ask any doctors, if you're gonna ask them why kidneys work, why heart works, why kidney does the job of filtrating urine and bringing some nutrients in the blood, why heart pumps the blood and brings it to all your limbs and to your brain. Nobody gonna tell you why and how it basically starts with the first scream of the baby when the lungs are open and when the person dies, all the functions cease to exist. Mm -hmm. And what Chinese doctors believe is that this is that energy, which is a life force, which makes us love somebody, which makes us breathe and eat and desire and et cetera. Besides the, and that special energy, it circulates in channels and meridians, which we also know exist. And they normally named after the organ because that channel of energy goes through the organ, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily connected specifically to that organ in a Western point of view. Mm -hmm. So for example, when we're gonna talk about kidney energy, kidney energy is not only about filtrating the urine. Kidney energy means so much more. It is your sexual drive, your drive to make money. It is a reproductive function of man and woman. But on the another side, on the emotional side, if it is in negative, it is fear. Why people, when they're frightened, mm -hmm. when they have fear, we say their kidney energy collapsing. And mm -hmm. remember, when you when something get frightened, it feels like everything dropped inside you. Mm -hmm. And other organs and meridians and emotions, which I'm going to talk later about, they also going to have very similar to each organ specific emotion and energy block. Mm -hmm. So another concept, very short, of Chinese medicine, besides energy, there is Jing. And Jing is our essence, our gene pool. It's what we got from our parents when we are born. Mm -hmm. That is our essence. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we're talking about genetic memory and how some conditions, you know, about Holocaust survivors, how they very often in, uh, inherit the fears what their parents went through. Mm -hmm. That comes from your parents, that uh, mm -hmm. DNA memory, that jink, that essence, and all our genetic diseases which come from our parents. So they already then knew that there is some kind of essence which we're getting. And finally, there is a concept of Shen. Shen translates a spirit as light, as God. So if you want to imagine these three major uh, treasures, mm -hmm. they're gonna be, if you think about a candle. So the candle itself, it is your essence, it's your jing. Mm. The flame of the candle, it is your chi, it's energy. It's what makes you move and want something and love somebody and desire and dislike and finally mm -hmm. shen is your spirit it mm -hmm. is when you walk in the room and you as psychologists know very well when patient walks in the room you immediately can say if that person has a good spirit or not in a good spirit because mm -hmm. somebody who has a good spirit they walk in they own the room the room gets lighter and you feel their good energy or mm -hmm. when somebody walks in the room depressed we say it's like there is a home, but nobody is there. Mm -hmm. The energy is really collapsed. Mm -hmm. And you see it in there, no light in the eyes and the way they walk in and the room. So I think these three very important um, concepts, we call it three treasures, which we need to understand when we're talking about Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. 
that's a fantastic synopsis. I had never heard all of those things. And not only does it make sense, but it's it's really inspiring. And and I want to remind our our listeners that, you know, Lucy is exceptional because she is a doctor from the former Soviet Union, a neurologist, and then came to the States and became a doctor of Chinese medicine. And so when you talked about the art and science, I was thinking about how truly you have brought together the two and have integrated them as part of your practice. You know, Andrew, I probably never shared with you, and I definitely don't write about it in my bio, my CV, but I did start practicing Chinese medicine on my first year when I did fellowship in neurology. Because, it, you know, God sometimes sends you challenges for a reason. And I had a patient which had just low back pain, which I completely could not help with. For three weeks, patient would not get out of the bed. And we had grand rounds. And because I'm from that part of former Soviet Union, which is called Uzbekistan, mm. uh, it is close to China, Afghanistan, Tibet, Mongolia. We had a lot of doctors from Tibet. So we had grand rounds and I'm uh, presenting my patient and telling that within three weeks after doing everything possible from steroid injections to epidural blocks to painkillers. I cannot help the patient. And this guy from Tibet tells me, did you try acupuncture? And I say, what is acupuncture? I even didn't know after going through seven years of medical school what acupuncture is. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, if you're interested, I'm going to walk in your uh, patient's room after the grand rounds and I'll help. And he put the needles on my patient for half an hour. And in half an hour, the patient who would not walk for three weeks got off the bed and told me, that's the way you should treat me, doctor. I Mm -hmm. thought I'm going to die. My (laughs) ego of a young doctor completely collapsed. And that's how I decided to do this specialty Mm -hmm. in Chinese medicine Mm -hmm. with my specialty in neurology. So I had double fellowship. And for the first seven years of my practice in the major hospital in Russia, in Uzbekistan, former Mm -hmm. Russia, I did treat all the patients from, it was the time of the war with Afghanistan. So I've Mm -hmm. seen a lot of patients with multiple traumas and stroke patients, epileptic patients, patients with all sorts of mental problems. I treated them with Western drugs and acupuncture. And that's when I start realizing that there is that magic, which I need to know. Mm. And when we came to the United States, uh, there are 22 practicing physicians in my family who came from Russia, who is practicing right now. I'm wow. the only one who went into Eastern medicine. Hmm. And everybody was laughing at me, telling me, oh, you're never going to make money. Nobody respects this medicine in the United States. But after seven years of practicing it in Russia, I realized I want to learn and I want Hmm. to practice this medicine because Hmm. there is something. Yes, it is science. You need to know your 1,300 points and you need to know location and anatomy and your 4,000 herbs. But there is a magic in it. There is an art in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the trauma that you witnessed in, in patients back in in, um, in the, the former Soviet Union. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I'm wondering how does, in general, how does Chinese medicine view trauma? Trauma is a very, very complicated issue uh, and you don't have just one way of treating the trauma. Because of course, as it is in Western medicine, we know that it could be physical trauma or it could be emotional trauma, or most often it is a combination of emotional and physical trauma. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit that uh, trauma patients follow me all my life. When I was in Russia, it was a war with Uzbekistan and Tashkent was the first major city. It's a capital where all the soldiers from Afghanistan would be 
uh, located. Here in the United States, again, uh, I do work with veterans. And again, I see patients from Uzbekistan. Hmm. It's interesting, different country, same war. Hmm. So if we uh, will talk, let's say in general first, mm -hmm. in, in the global. So from China's point of view, we see trauma as a pathogen, which creates disharmony in uh, and disharmony and chaos in human body. And it could uh, create that blockage at the level of energy, the flow of energy, or it can create the problem at the essential level. So let's say somebody had amputated leg, somebody mm -hmm. had injury during the war, that's going to be the essence where it's created. Or somebody's shen, somebody's spirit, somebody's mind is disturbed. Mm -hmm. So you see how trauma will go at all three different levels, which mm -hmm. I just talked before. And our goal is, first of all, to figure out where the trauma is. And very often, trauma will affect all three levels. Mm -hmm. It's going to be something, somebody got amputation or injury to part of their body or burn on the body. Somebody, I, I know a lot of cases where women were raped, soldier, female, woman were Mm -hmm. uh, female patients were raped, and there are such a multiple trauma happening in that moment. Her body was assaulted, her spirit, her dignity, and uh, her energy will be disturbed. She's going to be going into fear. She's going to clam, and she will try to protect herself and not feel anything. So when we deal with the trauma, our job is really to figure out where do we start? Where mm -hmm. was the major damage done? Mm -hmm. And very often we will not even talk about trauma. Like when I get patients from a veterans hospital, for example, I, I see the history, I know what was the injury, but they don't want to talk to you about trauma. So mm -hmm. you start from building that patient-doctor chemistry and that trust. And first you just make them feel better and you work with their anxiety, their fear and their sleep. And when they start feeling better, when they don't feel as depressed or so much in pain, mm -hmm. they open up to you and they want to talk to you about the trauma. Mm -hmm. So in Chinese medicine, it's very different mm -hmm. than in Western medicine and psychology where we go directly into it. We sometimes will not even talk about what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And my belief, I don't want to take anything from a patient, like I will never take them off the medication I will never take any kind of information from them until I make them feel better, until mm -hmm. I make them feel safe and secure. Mm -hmm. And then they open up to you naturally. Right. And what I'm also hearing is that you're careful because the story can, can also be re-traumatizing. Very. That, so I, I really hear the respectful uh, nature of what you're describing and how important it is to go at the pace of the patient rather than to overstimulate them or, or overload them with what actually happened to them. Absolutely. We do respect the level of comfort of the patient. And of course, we do understand that the memory of the trauma could be as painful as trauma itself. That's what we see in post-traumatic stress disorder where people are relieving the trauma again and again and again. And the last thing I want them to have an attack of that episode, of them relieving that episode again in my office. Mm -hmm. Right. So you mentioned the idea of physical trauma versus emotional trauma versus 
really layered trauma, where, which oftentimes is the case, physical right. and emotional. But how, how would you describe the differences or how might you conceptualize um, treating somebody who has both emotional and physical trauma? Okay, so when we diagnose a patient with a trauma, there are different ways uh, we can diagnose. First of all, Chinese diagnosis is very different than Western. So we observe the patient and their energy and how they dressed, of course. But then we're studying such a subtle things like pulse of a patient which is very different than a pulse in Western medicine. Usually in Western medicine, the doctor puts a thumb on radial artery on one side, count basically the frequency and uh, heart rate, and that's it. In Chinese medicine, we're placing three fingers on radial artery on both sides and checking that pulse on two different levels, which gives us information about flow of that same energy, which I was talking in the beginning, mm -hmm. at 12 different channels and meridians. And let's say I feel something on the first position on the left side, which tells me that this is a heart. And this is not a heart as an organ. This is a heart as a, a seat of the soul. It's a broken heart. It could be broken heart. And then if I look at the patient's tongue, it's like all the little puzzles have to fit. And we have like over uh, 120 different pulses. And it's wow. a very fine art learning how to listen to a pulse of the patient. You have to have incredibly uh, sensitive tips of your fingers. And it is something which takes time to learn because pulse could be weak, could be wiry, could be slippery. And depending on which position it is, you're going to know what's going on. So mm. sometimes I don't need the story of a patient. I, I can just check their pulse and tongue and tell them their story. Or for mm. example, if this patient, which I said, will have a weak pulse in a hard position, and I'm going to look at his tongue, I'm going to see that the body of the tongue could be any color, could have any code, but the tip of the tongue, which is related to location of the heart, definitely will be very bloody red. Mm. And we have over 70 different types of the tongues. So broken heart patients always have red tip. Many years ago, I wrote an article, your tongue tells it all, because once I looked at the patient's tongue and pulse, I said, oh, I see a broken heart. And she said, are you a fortune tailor or what? <laughs> How do you know? Did somebody who referred you to me told you anything? I said, no, no, no. I, I never heard about you before. I'm seeing it because of this. And I gave her a little mirror and said, you see this little red spot? This is how I know that you have a broken heart. Wow. And she started crying and told me the long story about herself. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, with patients who had trauma, usually that trauma will be attached to some kind of very traumatic episode where they were very scared. And when we start talking with you, I said kidney energy is responsible for emotional fear. Kidney pulse, which is at the third position on both hands, right and left kidney, usually going to be very weak because their fear almost like collapsed them. That's going to be the patients who most likely are going to be depressed and have low energy and lost their desire to leave. It's going to be the whole uh, combination of different symptoms. Or patients who are like victims of assault, very often they're angry. They're so angry that it happened to them. And for anger, we have a different uh, channel um, related. And you're gonna feel it on the right side on the medium pulse, it's mm. liver pulse. Liver in Chinese medicine is responsible for anger. 
So usually you have that strong bumping pulse because they keep that rage for years. Rightfully so, because mm -hmm. they felt, or somebody gonna be scared. They're gonna be afraid of every man mm -hmm. who comes towards them or woman or whoever. Right. So basically our diagnosis, as I said, that's why I never ask them on the first, probably mm. first, second, third session, what's wrong with you. Uh, whatever they want to tell me, I'm going to take as information, but my treatment, my diagnosis mm -hmm. will be based on that subtle diagnostic tools like pulse, like tongue, like the way they look. Um, sometimes their face is, it is one of the ancient uh, Chinese diagnostic tools, the reading of the face, which mm -hmm. we don't have time even to scratch mm -hmm. the surface today. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say that Chinese diagnosis will be very different. And mm -hmm. what I said about emotions, that what we call five elements, where for example, mm -hmm. heart, it is joy, it is mm -hmm. fire or lack of it. Uh, for uh, earth, earth is usually your spleen and stomach, your digestion but it's also your center, your ability mm -hmm. to overthink something. If people have mm -hmm. obsessive thoughts, mm -hmm. we're usually treating that element. Mm -hmm. Metal or lungs and skin usually belong to emotion of um, usually it is, uh, oh my God. <laughs> Grief, uh -huh. grief, and how can I forgive grief when I had so much grief in my life? But right. uh, remember when you read old classics, they would say, or, or like her lover died or his lover died and three months later, that patient died from tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. It was like so classical. Mm -hmm. Now nobody dies from tuberculosis or very few people do. Mm -hmm. But people usually have, a lot of allergic reactions, asthma, after they experience the loss of the loved one, mm. it will be very, very often asthma. Mm. Or they're going to have rash all over the, system, or the body because lungs, metal element, grief element will be manifest like that on a physical level. Mm -hmm. Uh, water, as I said, kidney would be usually fear. Mm -hmm. And another, the fifth element would be wood. And I also mentioned about it, wood is liver and cold bladder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be usually anger because uh, emotion of liver is stored in wood. That's mm -hmm. what usually happens. Mm -hmm. It's so much to take in, and I, I, I don't think I've ever heard in such an organized fashion the different parts of the body and how they are, are viewed by Chinese medicine doctors. It's so clear the way you're, you're describing it. And I also wanted to say that you don't know this, but one of the primary themes of my book was brokenheartedness. And yeah. I really see all addictive compulsive behaviors as... Uh, if we just scratch the surface underneath is, is heartbreak, but we won't get into that today. But I, I, I just am so taken with the idea that even though we're from very different modalities, we very much complement one another. Oh well, yeah. I think that uh, the work of psychologists and the work of acupuncturists somehow interwined because in Chinese medicine, unlike in just regular Western medicine where, okay, you're depressed, they're gonna give you a Zoloft or Prozac. We don't look at emotions with that simplicity because mm -hmm. the same emotion, what we call, for example, anxiety or depression mm -hmm. would be the, translated into Chinese in so many other, it could be grief, it could be shame, it could be guilt. It's all different little nuances of emotions. Sure. And they will be treated differently. Right. 
And very often addictive behavior comes from China's point of view. It's like somebody who is lacking something, their heart is broken, they don't have enough love, they don't have enough fire, and they're trying to replenish it. And somebody mm -hmm. can replenish it with sex. Somebody will, and they have pain, so they're gonna do it with drugs with painkillers, somebody gonna uh, replenish because there is that lack of something which they are trying to refill. Mm -hmm. It is, it's not just, it, it's always energy, but it could be a different type of energy. And yes. somebody will try to, somebody gonna do stimulants because they don't have energy. Mm -hmm. they, they feel tired. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is depressed will do it uh like with extreme sports or extreme pleasures extreme mm -hmm. sex so they want to feel alive that's what right. they want right they mm -hmm. want that feeling of being joyful and happy mm -hmm. and they don't know where to go and they go into drugs or sex is also drug of course and extreme sport, extreme emotions, or painkillers, if pain right. is so unbearable that they don't know how to continue living. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you and I are basically talking, maybe our jargon and our terms are different. Mm -hmm. But I decided today to give you a little bit of flavor. Normally mm -hmm. when I do lecture like in Cedar sinai or in UCLA, I don't give that much of Chinese terminology because they want to hear, okay, this is endorphin, this is dopamine. And I can talk like why when I put the needle in, mm -hmm. it is a specific uh, reaction between the needle and the body. And then it goes into your spine and then it goes into your thalamus, hypothalamus, and then it gives command to your body to release mm -hmm. endorphins or dopamine or this or that, and that's how acupuncture works. And this mm -hmm. is actually, it is proven, scientifically proven. People did do functional MRIs. They did measure the <clears throat> amount of endorphin and dopamine in the blood of the patient before and after acupuncture. So mm -hmm. I can prove with science with multiple clinical trials mm -hmm. that everything what we do has scientific proof mm -hmm. that it is not a voodoo medicine right no we are not that. questioning these days if acupuncture or chinese medicine works they want to know how it works right and if we want to keep talking about western terms i can give you the whole lecture on the western level Mm -hmm. But I think because you are a psychologist and the very subtle nuances of human psychic is mm -hmm. your area of expertise, right. I'm trying to bring more of that philosophical flavor of Chinese medicine. Absolutely. So we have time for one last question. Okay. And, and the question that I was curious about is what you mentioned to me, which is emotional cleanse. And I, uh -huh. I'm not clear what that means and, and how does that relate to trauma? So emotional plans is something not many patients or even many acupuncturists know how to do because we have, like I mentioned, 12 channels or 14 channels and meridians, depends if you count do my and ren my or not. But we have superficial channels and they're called after rivers of China. But we also have what we call extraordinary channels, which go deep into root of the problem. And when we do emotional cleanse, I'm using only four needles and I'm usually sitting with the patient for 30 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes. And patients are getting into very deep level of their pain. And I'm asking them to go with me through every single painful, emotional, physical, or spiritual experience in their life. Mm -hmm. And although it's only four needles, mm -hmm. it, it is very deep. It's like, instead of getting through the uh, river, you're getting into the ocean of emotions. Mm 
Wow. And they bring all their painful experiences. And then we together kind of bring the common picture. Because people usually tend to fall in love with the same man or the same woman. Mm -hmm. Or if they had been abused by their parents, very often they're going to continue abusing or being abused. Mm -hmm. So when you do the whole life plans, you see the patterns. But you can bring it to the surface because when you um, analyze somebody as a psychologist, you go through their brain, through their emotions, through their mind. But we also go through the body memory. Mm -hmm. because there is so much stored in our body as a memory of pain. And that's why you need to go into really deep work. I never start emotional plans on the first session on the second. I need to know a patient very well. And mm -hmm. we have to build a very strong bond of patient-doctor trust mm -hmm. where they feel comfortable talking to you about the most sacred pain they have. And does it tend to be one session or, or several sessions? How does that Usually look? it is one or two sessions and it's very painful. And after that treatment, I always tell them, don't go to the movie, don't go to the party, don't do business meetings. It should be in the end of your day. I want you to go in nature, to the ocean, to the forest, hug the trees. You're going to dump a lot of negative emotions and pain mm. today. I want you immediately to replace it with good energy, with something you enjoy. Mm. Take a bath with uh, candles and bubbles or walk on the beach. Do mm -hmm. something really which will replace all that negative emotional poo which you mm -hmm. dump in my room and replace mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So something exceptionally nourishing would be important. Yes, because they're going to clean themselves literally from a lot of painful emotions. Hmm. Fascinating. So that is all the time we have for today. Okay. And I would love to invite you back at some point for us to do a part two, because like you said, I think we're just brushing the surface right, and getting started with our conversation today. But it's been so um, not only educational, but it's inspirational to, to hear the kind of work you're doing and, and how it really affects the, the type of folks who have gone through trauma as well as various kinds of addictive uh, compulsive recovery. So thank you so much, Lucy. I, I so appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Like I said before, I'm honored and I will be happy to continue our dialogue. I look forward to it. Thank you me so too. much. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening today. It was so terrific sharing the time with my colleague, Dr. Lucy Postolov, and discussing this really significant topic. She can be reached through her website at lucypostolovacupuncture.com. And if you're so inclined, please give us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe and share my podcast with those who may benefit. I look forward to you joining us the next time. And don't forget to stay connected. Stay connected.